If you want to reliably work DX, a homebrew station like this is probably the simplest option. A mains power supply giving 12 and 30 odd volts, and a homebrew regenerative receiver with companion CW transmitter. The 30 watt power output is much more practical for regular DX working than lower power. And the degree of frequency agility will allow you to search and pounce as well. Here I'm introducing my third ceramic resonator based regenerative receiver. But that's not all. Given it was such a good receiver, I decided to put in a transmitter section. It starts off with a ceramic resonator, also on 7.16 MHz. It's a long way to pull it down to 7 MHz, but I achieved just that in this VXO. The receive and transmitter are separately adjusted. It's a bit unwieldy to operate. In fact, there's very little common circuitry in here, apart from the transmit receive relay. So it's really a transmitter and receiver in the one box. Just taking a look at the receiver circuit board in more detail. Here's the RF amplifier transistor. This is the regenerative detector. And here's the audio preamp. The circuitry is the same as in my previous videos. What's new are the audio filter stages. Again, two NPN transistors, resistors and capacitors. They drive an LM386 audio amplifier for the headphones, although it will power a speaker. It might come as a shock that this rig puts out 30 watts. It wasn't intended for portable use, so I could be a bit more flexible in the power supply, even running the final amplifier of 30 volts. As you saw in a previous video, I already have a suitable power supply to run it. Starting from the low level stages in the transmitter, here we've got another ceramic resonator for 7.16 MHz. An MPF102 FET VXO allows coverage over a wide part of the 40 meter CW segment. The output from the ceramic resonator oscillator goes to a IC and 74HCO4. That's a series of inverters and that's set up to boost the output. That's actually keyed. We've got a keying transistor here which applies DC to this buffer IC only when the key is pressed. The output from this keyed buffer stage goes to the final amplifier which as you can see here is very haywire and is an example of how not to build equipment. For instance, the heatsink is a little bit small and I should put in a cooling fan to keep it to an acceptable temperature on long overs. And these wires are carrying RF. Nut, nope, I should have used shielded coaxial cable for that. Nevertheless, the performance is very good and it worked first time, which is a rarity for me, especially when power amplifiers are concerned. In fact, this rig came together much easier than any QRP rig I built despite its higher power. And it's no more complex, apart from the mechanical considerations of heat sinking. The output is filtered by this low pass filter, which by permanently being connected to the antenna socket is also in the receiver line as well. Transmit receive switching is done by this relay and there's a manual control on the front panel. That's another thing I'd like to change. I want it to be semi break in so I don't have to manually switch from transmit to receive. A quick look at the circuit. This is the receiver, the same as before. The front end and oscillating regenerative detector is exactly the same as what I've previously shown. Moving along to the right, an audio preamp uses an NPN transistor, a BC548 or 2N222 or similar. And that proceeds to audio filter stages. The output of that, you can see the free end of the 220 nanofarad capacitor, goes to your very standard LM386 amplifier circuit. This is the transmitter section. On the left is our ceramic resonator oscillator. 
we'll just zoom in a bit that uses an MPF 102 because I'm only using a 50 picofarad variable capacitor I actually wanted a bit more capacitance so I've put in a switch with a 47 picofarad that gives you up to nearly a hundred and hence the two frequency ranges you see here 7007 to 7016 and 7016 to 7032 if you don't have a ceramic resonator well you could just use a crystal and you might get 5 to 10 kilohertz of pulling range up here is the voltage regulator using a 7805 I've put a diode in the common pin to increase its output voltage up to nearly 6 volts the spot switch you see here is a press button switch and all it does is apply 12 volts to the transmitter ceramic resonator oscillator when you're in receive mode. It doesn't activate the rest of the transmitter circuitry. The purpose of that is so you can hear your transmitted signal and zero the receiver into it. The other circuitry here, a BC558, though it could be any transistor, a PNP though, like a 2N3906, Anyway, the function of that is to provide a keyed DC voltage. When the base is grounded through a 10K resistor, then voltage appears on the collector, and that goes to subsequent stages. From the output of the MPF-102 oscillator, goes into an IC, I think it's six slots of inverters. It's a 74HC04. There's some more inverters connected up and there's two outputs you'll notice that one is inverted with respect to the other pin 14 of the 74HC04 is keyed by the aforementioned keying stage so there's no signal on the output when the key is up those who've built transistor designs might be quite amazed at the small number of stages required to get to a decent power level here the 74HC04 is directly driving a pair of IRF510s. Just take a closer look. You've got the two inputs from the outputs of the 74HC04. There's a bias voltage which is applied to both gates of the IRF510s. You'll notice there's two potentiometers. One is a trim pot, 5K, and the other is a potentiometer that extends to a knob on the front panel at 10k. The reason for the two is that the preset sets the maximum bias current. That's important because if you turn up the bias on these types of amplifiers, then they get hot and they can blow up. So you want something that sets a safe maximum. And then you can adjust the 10k pot to your heart's content, depending on how much output power you want. The connections are not marked, but those that are earthed are the source. Those that are not are the drain. And that goes to two toroidal coils. The first one there is actually two FT50-43s. The windings are bifile around. And the tapping point is your power supply rail. But in this case, 30 volts. The rest of the transceiver is off a 12 volt supply, but for the power amplifier, it's 30 volts. And then there's a capacitor going down to earth from that point. Then we've got another FT50-43, in this case only a single toroid, 12 turns of wire, twisted together in a drill. Anyway, they are wound over the toroid, and that gets you to your transmit power amplifier output. Just to clean up the harmonics, attached to that output connection is a low pass filter. In my rig, I've connected one side directly to the antenna connection and the other goes to a transmit receive relay, which I haven't shown in the diagram, but it is a double pole, double three relay. One section switches the 12 volts from the transmitter to the receiver and the other section switches the connection from the low pass filter switching it either between the transmitter power amplifier stage on transmit or when you on receive the input to the receiver's RF amplifier. 
the transmitter circuit was largely derived from radio projects for the amateur, Volume 3. This volume, along with 1, 2 and 4, contain many circuits for the home brewer, and is a highly recommended purchase. Although not complete, it's already proved to be a worthwhile project. How good? Well, I put this rig through its paces in the ARRL DX contest in the CW section. The antenna used here was simply a trapped dipole, 9 metres at the apex. That was a contact with K3LR. A bit of a struggle, but we got through eventually. That wasn't the only contact this evening. Earlier on, W3LPL was also worse, showing that even though it's hard going with a regenerative receiver, you can still make DX contacts, even in the middle of a contest. This transmitter receiver, though not finished, has been a most worthwhile project. Its 30 watt output allows you to work DX stations much more easily than with QRP. There's actually not a lot of difference between 30 and 100 watts, and there's a lot of times where people's noise level allows a 30 watt signal to be heard, but not one at lower power levels. <laughs> 